three o'clock mountain. So enjoy your half an hour talking about your farm, figuring out your marketing options and what you want to explore. And we'll reconnect at two o'clock PM Pacific, three o'clock mountain. Hello, everybody. Are we back? Yes, we are. Right. Do you want me to just begin oh. or do you want to? You know, oh, I, I'm sorry, my um, my sound didn't go through. So <laughs> I did do an introduction of you, Ariel, but it didn't go through. So I apologize. <laughs> um, so welcome back, everyone. This section is about the ecology of a small farm. And Ariel will be our first presenter and then Casey O'Leary, our second presenter. So with that, I'm handing it over to you, Ariel. All right, wonderful. Um, Thanks for joining us. I'm going to try to be faster with my slides because I really don't want to take up Casey's time. Uh, she has so much to share on this topic. And I will warn you, Casey, there are a few pictures of your farm in this presentation. I didn't even realize it until just the other day when I was updating it and went, oh, I hope that's going to be okay. All right. So we're going to get started here. Um, sometimes it's hard to find the little controls, but I think we can. There we go. Okay. So when we talk about the ecology of a small farm, what are we talking about? We're using terms that aren't always associated with agriculture. So we're talking about ecology. It's the branch of biology that really deals with the relationships between organisms, both with one another and to their physical surroundings. And then when we talk about a system, we're talking about a set of these connected things or parts that form a complex whole. And so an ecosystem is this community of living organisms interacting with each other, with the non-living aspects of a particular place and their environment, all coming together as this living system. So we talk about a, far and a farm ecosystem. We're talking about all the living and non-living components that come together to form this. And actually, this is a picture of Diane Green's farm from many years ago. And I just love it because it shows the ecosystem. It shows the beautiful, incredible forested environment where they live up in Sandpoint. It shows the changes they've made to that environment in putting in all this landscape and habitat for native, um, native beneficial insects and also the food crops to feed their community. It shows how they've augmented their ecosystem with the season extension techniques like these high tunnels. And then most importantly are the people because Green Tree Naturals is really a farm that belongs to the people that love that farm that have apprenticed on that farm and that buy that farm's food. And so this picture to me really sums up a great snapshot of a farm ecosystem, even though Diane's not in the photo, except she might be down there at the beginning leading the charge of the tour. So when you're thinking about your farm, do you think about the biodiversity on your farm? And are you intentionally increasing the biodiversity? 
And what we mean by biodiversity are the different, the number and quantity and, and range and diversity of species, both plants, animals, insects, um, fungi, bacteria, arthropods, right? So all of these things create that biodiversity. What are you doing to increase that? Uh, and here's an example. Um, this is Jessica Harold. She has a micro farm here in Boise. She has introduced a lot of different aspects to increase the biodiversity on her farm, both in the, uh, the diversity of enterprises. So turkeys, ducks, chickens, rabbits, um, bees, and then also the types of plant material from trees to shrubs to uh, edibles to medicinals, really trying to increase that biodiversity in her cropping, her livestock operations, and then just also in what she chooses to bring on the farm. So if we look at pests, you know, pests are perhaps creatures, species, biodiversity that we don't necessarily want on our farm. But how do we use ecological practices when we're trying to manage pests or to discourage pests? And it's important to remember that healthy plants and healthy animals have natural defense systems in place that help them to ward off a great deal of potential disease or insect pests. Uh, most insect pests in particular are very much drawn to plants that are in distress. Uh, and in fact, some plants send out chemical or even sound cues saying, we're in trouble, pick us, right? Um, and we've all thought, you know, th know about the predator that, that attacks the youngest or the oldest in that herd. It's the same when we're looking at plant populations. So a healthy plant or a healthy animal often has a defense system in place. Um, so a plant is susceptible to pest or disease when it is under stress for some reason, either underwatered, overwatered, um, it's being outcompeted, it's not getting the nutrients it needs, it's planted in the wrong place or the wrong environment. And so understanding also your pest's strengths and weaknesses, right? Is this a pest that thrives in warm and dry conditions? So how can you increase the humidity? Is it a pest that thrives in humid conditions? How can you dry it out? Um, so knowing the biology of your pest is as important as the, the uh, ideal biology of your place. So here's some quick strategies that we can use when we are trying to address this. So one is mimicking those natural systems. It's impossible for us you know, using cultivation. I mean, by, by its very nature, cultivation is, is artificial, right? We're, we're growing things that did not start out here. We're selecting species that have been chosen over, you know, sometimes tens, hundreds, thousands of years because they serve a purpose to us. They're not necessarily part of that original ecosystem. But we can mimic that natural ecosystem in some ways by increasing the use of biodiversity, choosing plant species that even if they're not native to the area, they have adaptabilities that allow them to thrive here, um, and using these strategies that we have in our toolbox. The other one is to reduce the disturbances of our environment, whether we're talking about minimizing or actually doing away with tillage. It would be very, very difficult in an organic vegetable operation to not have tillage as a tool, but if you have to use it, how are you using it sparingly? How are you using it just when you need to and not, um, not overdoing it? Uh, when we're harvesting and we're, we're cropping, are we returning nutrients to the soil? Are we fertilizing with materials that are building the soil and feeding the soil microbes, or are they just supplying nutrients to the plants, which we're then removing? Um, and then two, when we over-fertilize, when we apply pesticide applications, we can sometimes be encouraging pest populations. And you might think, well, that sounds counterintuitive. If you're spraying for bugs, how are you getting more bugs? Well, if we're spraying a, a, um, a non-selective broad spectrum pesticide really that's killing everything, right? There's somebody that's going to survive and it's usually another pest. And then all of a sudden the coast is clear, they've got no competition um, and they flourish and grow. So sometimes those things can really um, add to our troubles. So this is just a really quick chart about, um, you know, some of the different things that we have in our toolbox, right? So stressing the pests, but reducing the stress on our plants, building healthy soils, um, anything we can do to reduce that plant stress, whether it's optimal watering, optimal fertilization, um, putting the right plant in the right environment, right? Not trying to grow blueberries in a really highly alkaline soil in the, um, southern Idaho, uh, even if we want to. Um, yeah, so all of these things can help to actually increase the plant's resilience and then decrease the pest effectiveness. So you come up with the result that we all want, which is minimal pest damage. 
Um, in my class here in Caldwell, we all got a hard copy of this guide from SAIR, Sustainable Ag Research and Education, on a whole farm approach to managing pests. I believe that we've linked to this publication in the class website, and you can all download and read that for free. But this really talks about all these different ways that we can approach pest management from a whole farm approach rather than, I have aphids, what am I going to do? I have aphids, what's going on in my farm ecosystem that's allowing that pest to thrive and other things to not thrive? How do we encourage our natural enemies? And so this is a great question. How do you know when something is out of balance? Um, so this is a picture of a farm. Um, and Casey, you might recognize this farm. This is right about just before you took over this particular piece of property with Earthly Delights. So these guys had been farming this land for a really long time. And over time, they realized that they, things were getting out of balance. Um, they had had to crop so intensively to meet their market demand on such a small amount of acreage that they didn't have the luxury of pulling certain parts out in order to put them into a longer term cover crop or to let the land rest and regenerate. And so they started seeing a lot more disease problems, a lot more insect problems and weed problems than they'd ever seen before. And it was a real sign to them that if they wanted to continue to meet the market demand that they had, they needed to find more space to farm. This space needed to be um, pulled out of production for a little while, and they just didn't have the land to do that. Uh, so they ended up moving onto a larger farm piece and turned this over to someone with a different set of goals. Um, this is also another example of what can happen when we overstock livestock on a pasture. We're going to talk about livestock in the next class period, but this is just showing that that environment, there isn't a lot of biodiversity. The plants are obviously under a great deal of stress um, in the way that that is managed. And so how do you know when your system is working? Well, it would be the opposite of some of those, pro those problems. Um, here is that same piece of property that I showed in the first picture. Um, this is where Casey was growing um, a lot of the seed crops that go into the Snake River Seed Cooperative. So because of the different ways that she was cropping, because of the, of, um, the ability to put things into longer rotations, to have perennial crops growing in here, to, um, to start to really not be so focused on the vegetable production, but to go a different way, this land was able to really be rejuvenated again and be just as productive, but in a different way. And it absolutely gorgeous out there right and this is not that same property just because i was only at that property once but this is another example of how of a of a healthier situation ecosystem wise and plant population wise for a grazing operation you can see the biodiversity of plants um, and the the amount of space to animal ratio is improved and so that whole ecosystem has now been improved some other things that you might see when you know that things are coming back into balance. You might see higher prevalence of your beneficial insects. So your predators like this little dragonfly or damselfly here. You might see that when you do have a problem with aphids, if you give it a week, all of a sudden you've got these troops of lady beetles moving in and, um, and lacewings and other predators coming in to take care of that problem. You'll see that you have a fewer uh, incidences of disease, especially when we look at like tomato production. Tomatoes are so susceptible to diseases of all kinds, primarily a lot of bacterial and fungal diseases. But when you start to get your, um, your watering under control, when you're using mulches to protect and cool the soil, uh, when you're reducing the weed competition, you see a much fewer incidence of those problems happening. So, a healthy ecosystem is going to mean that these systems are working without as much uh, interference from you. So just a few best practices to kind of close us out here. So encouraging your healthy crops, building that soil health through the use of compost, the use of cover crops, um, rotations, adequate fertilization to keep plants healthy, but not so excessive that you're burning off your microbes or that you're causing plants to overproduce and then you're removing all of that benefit from the soil and you're not returning any, any soil organic matter back. Uh, your crop rotations can have a big part in this, you know, really thoughtfully planning your crop rotations so that you are returning to the soil the nutrients that the previous crop lost. And then controlling weeds. Weeds are often a sign that things are out of balance. Um, my timer just went off, I'm trying to keep this short, right? 
So weeds are often a sign that things are in, uh, in an imbalance. Um, perhaps your soil is too compacted. Perhaps your soil is actually too rich in certain nutrients and that can introduce certain weed species or your practices are really disturbing the soil to the point that weeds are really the, the best chance of anything growing. Um, and stressing your pests, right? So this being learning about the biology of that pest and, um, and help, you know, really starving them out so they have to go somewhere else. And then I think one of the best things we can do is enhance the, the habitat and the, um, the food sources and et cetera for our um, beneficial organisms. And we've got some, um, some resources here in our class and we've also shared things on the student site uh, for where you can find more information about how to build that up. We've got some webinars planned too. So once we do, we have a problem, sometimes you do have to resort to some kind of treatment. And this would be when you've got a last resort, you've tried everything else, um, and this problem is just really persistent. Maybe it's a noxious weed, you know, so there really aren't any native enemies or natural enemies of this thing or, or an invasive insect. So you've got to take some action. And so we want to properly identify the pest, make sure we know what we're dealing with. We do this through scouting and trapping. Um, we assess the population. Is it in numbers that poses a threat and an economic danger to our farm? Or is it something that we can weather and see what happens? Um, some pests we have a zero tolerance for, especially if they're on a high value crop and they're destroying it. Others, you know, it might just be some cosmetic damage. And then we want to start with the most appropriate, least toxic tactic or intervention and move up the chain versus the other way around. If we pull out our big guns first, then we've really eliminated the, their usefulness if things get worse. So looking at our cultural practices, the physical, mechanical, you know, if we're using hand weeding or tillage, then moving to maybe biological options or biorational options or products that will target a pest but are not broad spectrum killing everything in their path. And then as a last resort, sometimes resorting to chemical whether it's a synthetic or an organic, if that's really the last, uh, the last tactic that we have available to us. So you'll, I want you to think in your farms about what your strategies will be for ecological insect and weed pest management, really starting with how do we increase the biodiversity and the ecology of our farm. Um, and just really quick, last few things, um, whether you're a large farm, small farm, micro farm, some of these things can all be put into play. The use of crop diversity, crop rotations, uh, cover cropping, um, doing this on a large farm or a medium farm, or even a very small acreage. You can see they've got a flowering plants. They're using mulches. They're using um, different kinds of plants. They've got a lot of natural or naturalized vegetation going on. Uh, and you can even bring this to the smallest home garden. Right? You can see those same elements at play here in a very small backyard or micro scale urban garden. Uh, and I love this picture because even if you're still not quite on your property yet and you're doing square foot gardening, you can still have plant diversity, flowering plants, uh, and beneficial habitat. All right, so I wanted to give the rest of the time to Casey. I will sign off. Great. Thank you so much. So, so I'm going to go ahead and pass this on to Casey as soon as Valley County is ready. So Melissa, if you could just let me know when you're ready to share your screen and I will stop sharing mine. Hi, we're ready. Okay. Oh wait, just kidding. <laughs> yeah, we're ready to share screen. Yes. Okay, great. So you should be able to share your screen now. You should be able to share your screen now, she says. Is this Colette? It is. I could recognize your voice. This is Casey. Hi, Casey. Hi. <laughs> so there should be a little green share button at the bottom of your control bar that you can cl click on and then share your screen. Melissa's well, still working on it. Okay, great. For those of you in the audience, 
uh, sometimes this technology is a little bit hard in terms of changing in between our different remote sites where we have our presenters. However, in the end, it makes it a much smoother presentation if people can advance their slides on their own. So right now, Melissa, I'm actually seeing the presenter view versus the full screen view. Melissa, she says she's seeing the presenter view versus the full screen view. And Melissa, when you're in that presenter view, if you go up to the top so, left hand corner, so. there's a, a place where you can click extend display and that usually fixes the problem. She says if you're in presenter view, you go up to the upper left hand corner, there's a spot that has extend display. Hmm. Ariel, will you say that one more time, please? If you pull it up again, I can walk you through it. Yeah, so that would be easier. Yeah. I have this issue on my computer all the time. Okay, th I, this is Melissa. Okay, Melissa. Brilliant. <laughs> if you go back to sharing the way that you were. So it's not slideshow from beginning. Um, yeah, slideshow from beginning, do that. So same, same as you did before. Okay, but presenter view when I, when I do the share. Yes. Okay. We can, we can change it once it's up if it looks funny. So you'll need to click on that sh green share button in, in the bottom bar in your control bar. Right, I know. Sorry, thanks for everybody's patience. And the more pressure, the like the harder and slower it gets, I know. Okay. <laughs> that should be it. Oh, look at that, that's perfect. Okay, sounds good, I'm gonna pass it back to Casey. All right. All right, we're ready to roll. You're ready. Okay, great. Hi, everybody, all over the place. Uh, let's see. Uh, so we're here to talk about ecology of a small farm. Um, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> ecology, uh, I, there's a couple of like lovely quotes I love about, um, about ecology, which hopefully will, this will move. And I don't know. Yeah, it, yeah, there it goes. So um, the concept that no matter what you're looking at on your farm or in any sort of natural landscape, it's connected to everything else. It's kind of the idea behind this. Okay, let's go to the next one. And what Wendell Berry calls a music so subtle and vast, no ear hears it except in fragments. I love that quote. It's like we are, as farmers and gardeners, we are sort of attempting to orchestrate something in the natural world, but we're also a part of it. And so much of what goes on out there, we don't actually know. We don't understand it either. We're just sort of, um, we understand a tiny, tiny fraction of what's happening. So let's see. So uh, this is me, for those of you who don't know me. Uh, hello, my name is Casey O'Leary. Uh, this is my farm, it's called Earthly Delights. Ariel already showed a couple photos of it. Um, it's in Boise. It's a uh, three-acre piece of property. We farm about an acre and a half of that uh, and share space with multiple other uh, small farm enterprises on that land. Um, it's, I don't own the land. Uh, I rent, I lease it from the landowners, one of whom runs, uh, also runs a business on that same property. Um, our markets are uh, we do CSA, uh, Community Supported Agriculture. There's some members. So this is the model where farmers, uh, people pay for a share, pay up front for a share of harvest, and then they get, uh, they get 
um, share of vegetables every week for however long the growing season is. And um, I've also done like the fall CSA share where they just get one pickup in the fall of storage crops rather than a pickup every week. That's what we've been trying the last couple of years. That's been working pretty well. Um, let's see, we have, uh, we do garden in a box. So for people who want to do their own home gardens, we'll grow plant starts and seeds for them and give them a planting plan with a detailed planting plan for all of the starts that, um, where to put them and how to space them in square foot methods so they can grow a lot of food in a tiny little space as a home gardener. And then um, we also grow seeds, a lot of them for the Snake River Seed Cooperative, which is a business that we, um, that I started about six, six or eight years ago um, to expand our own farm seed production efforts, which we used to just market and sell under our own farm's name. We uh, wanted to start working with other uh, farmers as well. So, um, so that we could all kind of collectively work on growing seeds. So we do a lot of that. So, um, so right now the Snake River Seed Co-op works with all of these farmers around the Intermountain West. There's, I think like, yeah, 43 of us right now. Um, including many of the people that are all over, maybe some of whom are on this in other sites here. I'm not even sure who's all on this call right now, but um, yeah. So we all work together to grow seeds that are, we're adapting for our bioregion and we put them in packets and sell them at wholesale nurseries and stuff like that. And then I also run an internship program on my farm. Uh, it's a season long uh, deal. People come twice a week and we do curriculum based internship programs. So they kind of learn all the aspects of running a small farm, uh, at least the small farm that we, that we do. So that's my farm. So let's get into ecology of a small farm here. So I wanted to use this. Uh, this is like story time. So this is story of a radish. We're, we're going to call it ecology of a radish. So, you know, you start by planting this radish seed, right? Okay, so that's the first step. Then it grows into a radish. It's amazing. It's not only, uh, it's not just like the seed did that by itself, right? It has this whole network around it, which I think you all talked about a lot of this morning about soils and stuff, right? So we can do like, we got like worms, we got all sorts of microbes, we've got like all sorts of other, like all sorts of cool things going on that are interacting with the roots of that radish, making it healthy, feeding it, keeping it safe, all this cool stuff. And there's all that stuff's in there is like eating and pooping and eating each other and eating each other's poop. It's like amazing, right? So all that's happening. So just by planting that radish seed, you're helping to perpetuate this whole cycle of like organic matter regenerating right and then we've got then birds have food because you've been feeding worms now now the birds have the now the birds can eat the worms so you're actually feeding the birds too from your soil building efforts and then your radishes you can harvest them and you have you have food for you know your markets or whatever great awesome super awesome sustainability all that financial security yippity d awesome but if you stopped there this would be a real disappointment in terms of the ecological impact that that radish could have. So if instead of harvesting all of your radishes and selling them at market, what if instead you left some in the ground? Now, what happens? Now they get huge at the bottom. I don't know if any of you have ever done that and put radishes, like left them in the ground. They get massive. They get all weird and woody and start kind of coming out of the ground a little bit. But then they send up these huge flower stalks and then they just get covered in flowers, which you know what that does feeds the bees. So you got all these bees getting fed from all of the flowers and all the nectar just from that one little radish seed you planted. And then, then after the flowers get pollinated, they grow these cool seed pods, which you could then harvest those and eat those. And they're freaking delicious. So when they're in this kind of green stage, they get super good. Now they're starting to dry down. And now in our farm anyway, if anybody does seed production, this is a pretty common thing to have happen. They, they, as they start to dry down, we get a bunch of birds coming in, tons of birds. I wish I had a picture of birds eating my seeds because that happens a lot. Like a lot of them get eaten by birds. But yet, even though there's a lot of them that are getting eaten by birds, there's still plenty for me also. So I'm feeding birds the seeds also, and I'm getting the seeds. Then 
at the end of all that, I get freaking hundreds of seeds out of one seed that I plant. Now I got hundreds of seeds I can plant next time, right? So the ecological implications of planting a radish seed can be pretty massive. When you think about it, how it all fits together as a part of a whole ecosystem. So um, let's see, let's switch it. So in this type, this kind of thing, the idea of our, of our farms as ecosystems, this is not only the borders of our farm is not where this works stops right so let's go uh this is this is um this is like the monarch butterfly migration right so this monarchs are nuts because they take like four generations to fly from their overwintering grounds in mutual con all the way north it takes them like four generations to fly up there and then in the summer or as the summer turns to fall in a single generation one monarch will then fly all the way back to its overwintering ground and sometimes they'll even go to the exact same tree where four generations prior to them had gone without ever having seen it they're just that amazing but you think about all the borders all the, the national borders state borders all of this stuff that has to cross over in order to support the ecosystem of a monarch butterfly so you by let's let's switch it so you so you by planting this plant milkweed this is uh this is the this is the only food that a monarch butterfly caterpillar can eat is milkweed and so um so this is a picture of a monarch butterfly caterpillar on milkweed it's the only food source that it can have and so if you think about how many different ecosystems in different places across this huge thousands of miles corridor have to have this plant in them to move the monarch for a monarch to survive we're all working together to create this ecosystem it's like yes your own small farm is one little tiny chunk of this but it's a part of a much bigger picture so um so this is Diane Jones. She's my landowner, and she runs Dragon Wing Nursery, and um, that's her. That's her with a tiny little milkweed plant in her nursery plant that has a monarch butterfly caterpillar larva on it, inside of the greenhouse. She found, and she was so excited about it. You know, and it, and you think about what I love about this picture, and what I love about this concept is that, is that as gardeners and farmers, we are absolutely a part of the ecosystem that we are. We, we get to be in it. I mean, how many jobs do we have where a human being can actually be a positive contributor to an ecosystem versus like a cancer on the planet? I mean, I, that's, you know, part of the reason why I got into farming is I wanted to find something meaningful to do with my life. And I feel like, I feel like there's something about it's the ecology of it that keeps me in love with farming. It's that I'm just one part of this whole big picture. And by me doing my work, I can support and orchestrate all of these other species working together as well. And I get to just participate alongside of everybody else. It's super interesting. Okay, so uh, let's see. So here's some ways Ariel talked about some. We'll just kind of go down these fast. I don't know how um yeah i don't know well i'll try to just kind of bust through and we don't have tons of time but if anybody has any questions maybe at the end we can jump in there with questions but so um okay let's go with first one ariel talked about this a lot plant as many different varieties and crop types as you can on our farm we're planting hundreds of things hundreds of varieties every year i mean we're usually 150 to 200 varieties of things is what we try to grow for but even if you do 20 versus one that's a big huge step in the right direction for all the reasons ariel talked about earlier um so using organic method methods to encourage beneficial insects super important um you know i mean i grow hops at my house not really for production but I swear every year those things get covered in aphids like at some point I'm out there and they are just covered and I just because I'm not doing it for you know production exactly I can watch them and not freak out and then I'll be damned if right after that a bunch of ladybugs come in and then it's just like on I mean it is 
gnarly just carnage you know i like all want like ladybugs literally like a female ladybug being mounted by a male while chomping down on an aphid. It's like amazing. And then, you know, a few weeks later, all the aphids are gone. The ladybugs are just like everywhere. And then they take off, go find somewhere else to procreate. So yeah. Um, yeah. If I was spraying that, you know, spraying that, I wouldn't get that whole experience. It's way more fun as a gardener. So, um, yeah, so diversify your markets. That's the thing, you know, that's just good farming practices in general, you know, don't put all your eggs in one basket. And by diversifying your market, you're also diversifying the kinds of crops you're going to grow or, or the kinds of livestock you're going to have just by diversifying the markets that you have. And with both crop diversity and market diversity, it means that if anything, any one of these things fails, it doesn't really matter. Like the more different things you have going on, the less it matters if one of them fails. Um, okay, so um, yeah, using cover crops uh, to feed microbes and provide habitat, you know, there's so much we could do, obviously, whole, you know, days on just cover crops and all the cool ways that you can incorporate them into your farm, but that's a great way to just include other species and break certain um, insect and disease cycles by planting something else in an area um, in between crop rotations and um, yeah there's a lot there to unpack but we don't have time to get into it now so um, so intercropping and companion planting um, you know who likes to be next to who one of the things that was really successful for me this last year on our farm is uh, we had a sweet corn crop that um, we ended up like we we hoed it uh, when it was probably mm, maybe like a foot tall, we went through and, and did a really good hoeing, a second hoeing on it, and then underseeded clover, and it was great. And now that clover, right now, I just was, I was just back down in Boise um, last week and looked at it, and it was, it looks great. It's, it's, it's lovely, it's lush, it's living through the winter. So I basically seeded my fall cover crop in the middle of the summer. I didn't have to weed my corn anymore that whole time. It fed the corn the whole, the whole season. Um, the nitrogen, you know, fixing clover, root die off. Oh, so much. I wish we could talk about cover crops. But anyway, so yeah, so um, yeah, there's a lot of cool stuff you could do there. Um, this is a, this is like, you know, three sisters agriculture. So corn, beans, and squash planted in the same area. This is, you know, something that many, many different Native American groups have perfected over a long, long period of time. Um, and it works great to the corn. Basically, the beans use the corn stalks to climb up. The squash kind of winds around in between. Um, it supposedly helps keep predators and pests away from the corn plants. I don't think that works exactly like that, but you get three different foods. And actually, even and while they're companions in the field, they're also companions on the plate and in the diet. So you get, you know, you get corn, beans, and squash. Those are, you know, nutritionally complementary. You can live very, very well fed life on just those three crops for a long time. So um, integrating livestock and crops. Wendell Berry has that great quote about how at one, at, you know, it used to be that animals and plants were both cultivated always on farms and now we've taken he says this is the genius of american farm experts that they could take uh one solution and divide it neatly into two problems now we have like a problem of fertilize waste on the on the feedlot and a lack of fertility on the farm so if you can integrate livestock and and um, crops it's hard if you don't live on your farmland as i don't and um, it's hard to do livestock when you're not there all the time so that's not for everybody but um but yeah any amount of that you can do because the livestock poops and your plants can use the poop and it works really well um yeah um consider seed production i, I will make this plug obviously for selfish reasons but it's obviously a great way to add a lot of biodiversity to your farm it's a great way to support the ecology of your farm it's a great way to stay enchanted as a farmer because you get to see these crops do all of these things that you've never seen them do before um you know if you just pull out the radishes every time to eat them you don't get to go through that whole wild sexy crazy after process so um seed production is great and i just and even if you're not going to do seed production, considering the types of seeds that you're planting, I think can be really helpful. Um, you know, hybrid seeds are very genetically uniform. And so you don't get the kind of biodiversity in planting a hybrid seed as you do when you're planting an open pollinated variety. So those open pollinated varieties just naturally are more genetically diverse, which means if you have a more genetically diverse population, that means that 
no matter what else is going on in the ecology of your small farm, if you have, you know, some sort of in insect or disease outbreak, or you have some sort of weather event or whatever it is, the more genetically diverse a population of seeds that you're starting with, the more chance you have that some members of that population are gonna survive whatever it was. Versus like, if it's a hybrid, it's everything is very genetically uniform. So if it wipes out one, it's gonna wipe out most. So I think even just thinking about using more open pollinated varieties, so much of what market farmers do is industrial organic hybrids and you plant it and it's every plant's uniform and you get the same thing and it's great for market production and all that but it's not great for ecology of your small farm so depending on what you're going for if you can manage to have i mean we still grow a couple hybrids on our farm but for the most part we're doing tons of open pollinated stuff and honestly on my farm i used to spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars of, on seeds a year and i spend almost nothing now because I can grow and save my own seeds and plant my own seeds. I mean, it saves me money and it's adapting the seed populations to my own place, which is really, really useful too. Um, and then of course, feeding the pollinators. So making sure you have things that are blooming from as early as possible in the season to as late as possible in the season so that those pollinators have food all the way through their whole life cycle because there's you know if you've got bunches of stuff in the spring and then you don't have anything blooming in the fall then the pollinators can't stay there and build a home there so trying to trying to spread out things with bloom time that's another thing that seeds do for you they add a lot of blooms to your farm um yeah i think i think that's all i have um that says it did say i don't know i probably put it up too high on the thing i think it says something like so what kind what are some ways you can support the ecosystem on your small farm? So we'll leave it there. I'll leave my contact info up there for a second if anybody needs it. Um, yeah, but I think we're at four, we're just after 40 after, so we probably don't have time for questions, unfortunately. So, Well, if there's a burning question, then I'd say go ahead and write it in and we'll take that. At. So I'm going to give that, if you would just stay on a second, Casey, if there are questions, I can go ahead and kind of go through my wrap up if anybody has anything to type in. Thank you for that presentation and talking about what you do on your farm and the different seeds that are available and things to consider. Thanks for your um, contact information as well. We'll make sure that that is on the course website. So at your local site, your next steps are going to be doing some wrap up, reviewing what your readings and assignments are, and of course doing an evaluation for today's workshop. I do want to show you a couple things. So just a reminder, here you do have a student page. On that student page, you'll have your readings, your homework assignments, and then please bring your completed workshops or your completed worksheets to the March 21st workshop. At the top of the screen, you can see that we have the address for the student page and we have the password to get into that page. So I did mention that we have a webinar mini series coming up that one of our educators, Kate Painter, is leading and this mini series is called financial fitness for farmers and you're if you would like to join it, it is free. It's going to take place on Tuesdays during the month of March, month of March. So we have March 3rd, 10th, 17th, and 24th. And we try to do this over the lunch hour. So it's a one hour webinar. And each webinar is going to focus on a key financial statement. So we'll start with balance sheets and then we'll talk about income statements. We'll delve more into enterprise budgets and also into cash flow statements. In addition to the one hour webinar, which will be recorded if you are unable to watch it live, we will have online resources. So this is really a mini course about these four key financial statements. We definitely encourage you to uh, watch those webinars and to access the resources that are available. You can go on to the Cultivating Success website and and from the main page, click on Financial Fitness for Farmers. It's going to bring you to this page and you'll be able to read about and register for the webinars that are interest, of interest to you. So you can register for one or you can register for four. 
I also wanted to say that we've added you to our Cultivating Success bi-monthly email newsletter list. This is giving you a lot of information about programs that are coming up around the state. We are also including featured resources. And so I wanted to point out that this week we sent you this newsletter and there is a great new resource about white rot and garlic and other allium crops. So you might want to check that out. And then to just to remind you that at University of Idaho online under extension, we have a publications link that we provided for you. And there's dozens and dozens of publications that could be helpful to you as you develop your whole farm plan and think through your different enterprises. Of course, if you have any questions, please contact your site instructor, or if you need any help with the website, you can contact Mackenzie. Here is her email, mlawrence at uidaho.edu, and her phone number, 208-885-0984. With that, I want to thank Casey again for her presentation. We didn't have any additional questions that came in today. So I'm going to turn it over to your site instructors, and I will see you again on March 21st.